become a Christian, that's it. Now it's just, hey, look at it, look at it, it. I need you to understand something. To bring the change, God still needs a vessel. It doesn't matter what you do, God needs you. You know, to bring change in your home, in your life, in everything you do, God needs your hands. God needs you as a person, as an individual. Your relationship with God, you know, I don't care if you pray for 20 minutes, one hour, eight hours, or 24 hours a day. God don't have no favorites. But what He does is He's wanting a relationship, a two-way control. Now, what, I wanted, what I've done is, I, I was sitting and I said to you, Lord, you know, when I look at the miraculous things that happen, most people accept their circumstances and refuse to pray, change into them. So, for example, now, you got yourself into debt, suddenly you can't pay the debt, now you've got trouble. Now when you go back in the Bible time, you'll see what these prophets did is they did not accept circumstances as they are. They accepted God's word, and there's one thing about a prophet of God, he knows that he can bring change in his mouth. The moment he prophesies for your life, he expects that change to be now. It must be constant. Now, if you go look at it, when you buy a house, you can't just buy the house and just live there, because eventually it'll just be laminated. God wants you to be the change. Now, you can, you can take 10 people that buy a house on the same day. When you go look, they all have a different starting point. Everybody will start at a different point. Somebody may start in the garden to say, right, my house would look better if I did the garden. Someone else will say, no, I've got to paint. Someone else will say, I'll start with the roof. Another one will say, I'll start with the driveway. But at the end of the day, the more you push into the project, that's the only way you're going to bring change. Now, God expects every one of you to bring change. Now, I've taken a couple of the guys that I, I can take as characters. Like Moses, when he looked at himself, he saw himself as a man of lack of speech. So, you know, you would think Moses didn't have a prayer life. You would think Moses probably was one of the guys that didn't, because he could not speak nicely, he decided, oh, well, he'll just not pray. But that's not true. As you read the Bible, you'll see that Moses actually spent time with God for 40 days. <laughs> now, all of these things that you see in the Old Testament, they call it in, the, I think it's the book of Corinthians or Timothy, where it says that it's a shadow of what's to come. So whatever happened in the Old Testament definitely can take place in the New Testament. So when you are in debt or you're in a stage in your life where you think, hold on, man, how can I bring change? I want to tell you this, start speaking that change. Start commanding it to happen. Start calling that change and saying, listen, I can do it. Now I've chosen Elisha because Elisha had a double mental. You'll see, firstly, God calls him. When Elijah ran away, God said, right, I want you to go back and I want you to ordain Elisha. Now you'll see he goes back and he ordains Elisha. But you can see Elijah, he's not too kapla about this Elisha character. Because you'll see, he's always here, he's always there, but guess what, Elisha sticks close. Why? Elisha knows that the mantle of anointing is resting on this man. Now, Elisha learns from him. You'll see Elijah's walk is a short walk. Like Jesus' walk is only a three-year walk. There's no such thing as Elijah was born there. It just says Elijah, Elijah the Tishbite. Okay? So in other words, you've got to see what's happening. I've chosen Elisha in the Old Testament. For those of you who have a Bible, go to 2 Kings 4, from verse 32 to 36. Now, yeah, you're going to notice... When Elisha came into the house, there was the child lying dead on his bed. He went in there for shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Now, we know what happened here. Yeah, the Shumite woman, she had seen that, listen, uh, her son, remember what happened with the son? Is he was born, she didn't ask for it. Elisha said to her, what can I do because you've been good to me? And he, he then, guess what? Gehazi said to him, listen here, man. This woman hasn't had a child. He said, well, no problem. He says, this time next year, you'll be holding a boy. So guess what? 
If you see what happens, she has a boy. And you'll see she's happy, everything's content. But then there comes that day. She wakes up and she finds out the child is dead. She doesn't even let her husband know. You see, there's something about circumstances. When you stand in the Word of God, this woman knew that this son was the direct word spoken by the prophet. Because he said to her, this time next year you will be holding a child. So she goes running off to Elisha and she says, listen, what, why did you do this to me? But when she's coming, now watch this, this is where I can prove to you, God doesn't let everything go through his prophet. Because Elisha stands and he says to guys, isn't that the Shumite woman coming? And guys, he says, yes. He says, I don't know why, but I can't see why she's coming. Go find out. He comes back and he says, the son has passed. Then he, he, Eli, Elisha's obviously thinking, you know what, let me do a shortcut. Servant, run ahead, go raise the dead. He commands. But the woman's faith is not in the servant. It is in who? Elisha. So she forces Elisha. She says, I'll not leave unless you come with me. Now, Elisha goes. Now you'll see, as you read on, you'll notice that when he gets to this place, he leaves her outside and he goes upstairs. He lies across his boy and guess what? He gets life back into the kingdom. He comes down and he says, the right desert, gets your son back. Now, can you imagine that woman? Because remember when her husband asked her, when she left the home, she said to her husband, I need, I need a donkey or something, I need to get there. And the husband thought, why? But she didn't dare speak what was going on. She did not speak death. She would not accept the fact that her son had passed. But you see, she knew this. She knew that he was ordained by God because the, the man of God had prophesied over her. And she took that prophetic word and said, you know what? I'm going to stand on that. And then she made the very man who prophesied over her say, right, listen, you, it's your fault. Let's go. Come. Now, here you can see the man of God doesn't even hesitate. He says, okay, no problem. But you don't see him going on a 40-day fast or doing this or doing that. You see him just immediately taking control and guess what? Telling the universe what it will do. Amen. You need to know that you are in control. Jesus has given us that power. Jesus has given it to us. Now go with me to with Elisha uh, from uh, 2 Kings 6 verses 1 to 7. Yeah, I want to show you something. The prophets are all gathering, and guess what? They go out to go and chop uh, a tree down, and the one guy's axe head falls in the water. Now, I don't know about you, but with me, I know today we're very sophisticated. I would you now, it's going to be a magnet, walk on fast of a fist, and sit in magnet in the water, and go and see that eight This guy do not work like that. So the man of God said, Where did it fall? And he showed him the place. So he cut off a stick and threw it in there and made the iron flow. <laughs> I don't think you got the key. In other words, there's no formula. Does anybody know a formula to make a metal float? All right. Watch this. He doesn't, and it doesn't say, watch this. A guy comes to me and says, Colin, the ex head fell in over there. I said, hold on, brother. Father God, I need word and I need it now. Lord, I really need to know what do I do, what do I tell this man. Father, a metal is laying at the bottom of the river and he borrowed. Father is a big clip with a day. Can't you help, Lord? He doesn't. You know how he reacts. He walks up to a tree, cuts off a stick, says, Where did it fall in? Over here. Yeah. Bang. Take the axe and go. I pray you get that family of God. The power is in you to change your circumstances. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Now I want to show you something. Peter, when we go to walking on the water, because now we're in a New Testament, I just want to show you something. Go with me from Matthew 14, uh, verse 22 and 23. Now, Peter gets confronted when he sees Jesus coming on the water. Now I'm going to do Jesus last because it's important that you notice this. That sometimes just by prayer, 
I, 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 I'm going to give you another example. I never asked God for a new car. I did it. I, I, I had a car. Okay, the thing was after the stop. Why? Because while I was reversing, I went to go visit the satanic order. And while I wanted to go visit her, she said to me, I said, call me, they will find your box out here. And she said, if you see where I label, say, never mind what, great story. As I'm reversing, I smack the tree. I thought, how can I eat this tree? I've got senses at the back of the car. How does this work? Anyway, she warned me. Now, I'm happy with my car, because I've got a pedal beater. You are a pedal beater. You take, so, I don't even need to ask God, I just ask you, you're a pedal beater. Do you know what I mean? Uh, praise God. So, what happens is, I don't ask God for a new car. I never did. The next thing I get a call, the woman says, I remember the car we blessed to her. I said, Josh, she says, well, we want it back. I said, okay, no a problem. You obviously need to bother me. But now I'm going to ask why. She says, do you know why I need it back? So I thought, well, that would be nice. <laughs> she says, because I want to give you a brand new one. That's why you call, stay there, and see the driveway. Guess what? I didn't ask God for a new car. My father provides because he knows my needs. And now I sit and I think to myself, but Father, why did you do this? He says, because I came. And I need you to know, do you know how many cars, you don't want to know how many cars have been blessed with? I'm not going to make you jealous, relax. Okay? But I'm telling you, I've been blessed with enough. And I want you to understand this, that when God brings a circumstance, He wants to know, when are you going to take authority? When are you going to make it happen? Now Peter sees Jesus on the water, and he starts to think to himself, I mean, come on guys, think about it. He's sitting at the lake or something, he goes, I can stop. He sees him, yes, man. No, no, but I can't go. On this side, but I can't go. What do you do? Now, Peter says clearly, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you. I bet you when you finish that sentence, he thought you were book, but brought you down. And when Jesus said to him, come, he must have thought, well, he is like, he called him. But when he got out, and he got a little word. Family of God, can you imagine how the universe changed to obey that word? Come. And we all know that while he was focused on Jesus, he could walk on that water. But the moment he turned to see the storm, he said, Do you know what's our problem? We turn and look at the storm. You need to understand tonight, if metal can float because you throw a stick in the water, now, I'm telling you guys, a lot of people say, don't take it literally, it's spiritual. <laughs> Let me just tell you something. Sometimes God has to do it physical so that you can see it so you can change. Okay? And here we can see that Peter, can you imagine all the other disciples? While this guy gets out the boat, boat, what would you have been doing if it was your brother getting out the boat and taking a walk on the water? I would have told you, maybe we'd just take this life jacket, just in case. Okay? Just think about what you're doing. The corner just counsel you for three minutes. Can you know what kind of fish are you underneath you? You see, when you work with man's intellect, you work wrong. But when you work with Jesus, you don't see nothing but the law. That's it. Focus. Alright? Now I want to go down here and I want to just show you something about Paul. Paul comes along and he starts to, he thinks he's working for God. But he also realizes suddenly that his focus is wrong. And God writes him for three days. And I want to show you something. When God tells you, go and pray for that man, sometimes you think, Lord, do you know that guy? Now you can imagine how the priest felt when God came and said, I need you to go to that address and I want you to pray for Saul. He said, God, do you know what you, do you know who that is? Can you see? He's talking to the most high God, but when it comes to take on a little demon, he says, Do you know who that is? That uh, kills people, but what do you know what God? What God where does God take you? He always gave. But you see what I mean? Even as a priest, your focus is not always there. 
He didn't see the great king. All he saw is Dio's Pudera. Can you let me see him? <laughs> Think about it. And sometimes God puts you in a situation where you just have to do it. And you think, yes, Lord, can't you just do something? And I like to use this testimony because it's the truth. And I've got the police to prove it. I started selling eggs after I was selling drugs. I decided eggs are going to go So I started selling eggs. All right, never mind. That's not for the kids. I didn't sell it. I was selling smarties and I decided chocolates are better. So whatever it was, I decided to sell eggs. And this policeman came and said to me, Colin, here's a copy in 60 boxes of eggs. Now, when he asked me, I've got an idea. I said, yo, let's sell eggs. I thought we saw one or two trays and it's lacquer. He brings 60 boxes. I said, okay, I'm going to tell you something. Made my first day, I sell 60 boxes of eggs in two hours. I come back, I couldn't believe I had so much money. This I said, it counted all the money to make sure I didn't steal one egg. He says, yes, Colin, I didn't trust you. I thought you were going to duck with my company. I said, don't worry, really. the bucks are here. <laughs> so we come running up and down, me and Barbara. Yes, it's like, hey, it's a group, hey, yes, I tell you. All I know is, they're kind of, they're kind of, that means X, let's go. And I'm all going to go, hey, yes. But guess what? On a day, in quarter, and the A and C are having a dirt roll. And guess what Colin does? I come right down the main road, right with the ambulance, even the cops don't go there. And me and Barbara are busy riding, and you know, we're doing that like a spiritual thing. Hold on, it's hard to be humble. <laughs> and, go, and I come down this road, and the next thing you check, here's like, he's not wearing a gun. What's that stop? They shoot me across the road, here we sit. And the next thing I call me to you, Dog Rondi, Oli Drona. Now I know my father's a rhetorician, I thought it's easy now. Red, red, yellow, yellow, blue, blue. <laughs> I think I didn't need the dashboard, I'll just need copper. <laughs> I see what I'm doing. I said, Lord, what do I do? And all I hear, Barbara Chini, I thought, she says, pray. I said, okay. I pray. Now, I'm sitting with my hands underneath the dashboard and I'm looking. This side they want to kill, that side, that side wants to kill, this side, and that's back in the middle. And that. I think those acts must have thought, what can you do about that season? <laughs> now I've got my hands underneath the dashboard and I'm just connecting. And the next thing I touch these two wires that probably just go on. Bobby just go, 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 go. <laughs> and it was dark now. Yes, yeah, Tony. We get out of that circumstance. I pull up and I'm going down. We're really shaking. I'm from Lowland Street. I'm actually not Lowland Street. Actually, you call me come on. I come down and someone, I say for mom, you better bring an hotel in two cities. You can't. You can all your worry and go down. You just want to take a walk. I say, I can't get away from it. It's not in the brook. I say, for me, I say, in the house of TV, I say, I'm going to eat a scene in court of a car and wood. I say, what a chance. You must need one. I say, come connect. Anyway, we get there, we get out to call me, and hey, the next thing, five minutes, it's like I I actually find him as I was coming out of 10 weeks, and I said, you better meet me at home. I just got home, I just popped the call me, and I said, there's all the electricity. So they get out the car, and the son comes, he looks underneath the dashboard. He turns out his sister, and says, you don't live here, man. This car can't go nowhere. Lawrence tunes me. Fair chance, you couldn't have driven this copy. He said so. I said, is it? I said, come here, sir, Mr. Clever. And what guy, you know, copy's got an engine at the back. I don't know why they bought VW like that, but anyway, <laughs> it's the other way around. I opened the seat, it's like, it's his end, and he chose A. And he says, my engine run him. I said, yeah, I said, I get no net, he gets off on 10 visa. If this copy hasn't moved, how do I get the engine on? He chose Lowlands. Yeah, I just saw that thing. He walks away. Now listen to this. I tell him it's clear. You know, he laughs at me. He says, oh, he says yes, from Draggery to, to Christian. They shoot him into a visa. You know, it's the first thing he did when he recovered. He says, I want to come testify in your church. Your God loves. Amen. Amen. Praise Amen. Jesus. Amen. Now, I want to show you something about Jesus. The thing that he was trying to teach all of us was to take control of your circumstances. He showed us that through love, you gain favor of the community. 
But he also says clearly in his word, trust no man. You see, there's one thing about Jesus. He knew that this walk would not be easy. But he knew one thing for sure. That if you can just get to work together, your chances of making things happen are so much better. If we go back to the Tower of Babel, we'll see right in the beginning, how do you get God off his throne? Just make an agreement. Because what did God say to the Father, and the, what did He say to the Holy Spirit and His Son? He said, let us go down, I want to see what these people are doing. And then He says, now that they're in agreement, we're going to have to divide their language. Now I need you to understand something. Have you ever tried to communicate to someone that doesn't speak English? <laughs> and next nothing, you can start talking to you, you'll check. It's just this all. Because you try to explain to somebody, and because you cannot understand the language, guess what? There's usually some kind of uh, frustration. Now what God's trying to show us is that the more we agree, and the more we stand in unity, the better for us. But if you take a look at the things God has done, now let's take a look at all the prophets of old. If you go look at what they did, Jesus summarized it quickly. When he started raising the dead, they started to question. They said, wow, hold on, wait a moment, this guy even raises the dead. But hold on, Elisha had already raised a young boy from the dead. And yet they say Jesus is the first one to raise the dead. Now we've got to understand something. That you can be religious or you can take the word of God for what it says. He says, I've given you power and authority. Jesus said, I give you power and authority over all the earth. In other words, you have the right to speak it to heaven. But you've got to believe it. And if you don't believe it, how can you call that an agreement? Amos 3.3 says that two men cannot walk together unless they agree. So you have to agree. Whatever you do, agree. If you can ask your the stuff, he comes there, he says, Colin, you know what, I've got this problem. I said, you know what, make an agreement. And you can go check, go ask him. Every agreement, when we make an agreement, there's power. God moves in agreement. And you know what, you could be in a place in your life tonight where finances is a problem. I want to tell you something, money doesn't own you, you own money. Relationships, it doesn't matter what it is, you could be in a severe dry bone state right now. Ezekiel 37 tells you straight, he says, son of man, speak to that bone. Why is God commanding you to talk to that bone? Because he wants you to take control. Now I want to tell you something. Sometimes God uses prophets to give you a word. But sometimes God gives you a word first, and then you confirm it with his prophets. And you should know when someone's prophesying if it's right or wrong. And I tell you what, I've had many people try to make a fool of me when I tell them, listen, God shows me for that, and not for me. And then after the meeting, they come and say, listen, I see you. I said, yeah. I said, hey, man, how could you say that in front of everybody? I said, listen, man, you make that to be a liar. Relax. No more work. You understand? Because you must understand, God wants us to take control of our lives. We should not be running out there. Because the Bible says in the, in, in the book of Revelation, do not bore yourself out to the church. And you'll find people that run to all the different churches. You know why in the beginning it, it sounds good, but you know what? They're looking for a place that you call home. But it says when you have found that place, do not bore yourself out. You'll find that people that hear there's a prophet there. I need you to understand something. What's happening in America is for America. We live in Africa. Amen. Try and explain to these people which God. See, they look at you like you watch too much Harry Potter. Where does Harry Potter come from? America, England, wherever. But you know what? They say that we watch too much Harry Potter. And yet, if you take a look at African witchcraft, the state president puts it in the newspaper. I use witchcraft against the white man. Now that's dangerous. But I want to tell you something. I don't care how big your witchcraft, watch out for my Jesus. Praise <laughs> God. Tonight, did you guys enjoy this morning? I didn't even have a word, but I tell you what, what did I heard still? My God was on the walk and again. God was good. All right. Are we going to do healing outside? Or get on the title? Okay, cool, cool. All right, please, if you want to bless the church, feel free to do so.
But do you want to do healing outside or inside? In, inside, outside. Outside. Baker. Anybody wants it outside, inside? Four, four, okay. Outside. Inside. Okay. <laughs> I'll tell you something. A lot of people say to me, is it the sweat from the heat? I'll tell you something. Sometimes you realize it's not just the heat. Sometimes it's the energy. And I can't stop it. When it comes, I don't know what to do. I've already, I can prove it to you. I've dived in the pool, climbed out the pool, and carried on sweating in front of everyone. And see, how do you do it? I don't know. <laughs> All right? <laughs> if we do it outside, they call it we don't miss it. Are we going to move chairs? Okay. Right, let's move the middle right over here.